Angel is brought to you by Audible with an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at audible.com slash angelbook. Hey everybody, welcome to Angel the Podcast, which is the complement to angelthebook.com. Angelpodcast.com is where we continue the discussion that we started in angelthebook.com. Here we talk about angel investing with angel investors. We've done uh, 10 episodes in our first season, and you can visit them all inside of iTunes podcasting or Stitcher or any of the popular podcasting apps out there. You can also just visit the website, Angel Podcast. You can go to YouTube or SoundCloud. We put the episodes basically everywhere. Super easy to find. I'm Jason Calacanis, the author of Angel, and I'm here with Brian Alvey, who was my writing coach, my collaborator on Angel the Book. Brian, thank you for helping me with the book. I loved it. It was yeah, awesome. It really was cool. Uh, and you and I have both started companies together for background. We started Weblogs Inc. To Inc. together. We worked on uh, Silicon Alley Reporter and Cyber Surfer magazines in the 90s. And so we've collaborated for over 20 years, and angelthebook.com was the latest collaboration. I wanted to do an Ask Jason uh, series for the Angel podcast specifically because we're getting a ton of questions from angel investors and you have raised money so you'll be taking the position during this episode of the founder and uh, I'll be taking the position of an angel investor but you also have deep knowledge in the angel space as well so let's go right to the questions we got these are all the popular questions we've been getting since the book came out and the first one comes from Alan and he says what's the best way to verify the customers of a potential investment are happy with the product so an angel investor is thinking about investing in a company, but they want to verify that the customers of a potential investment are happy with the product. What are the best ways to tell that? This is during due diligence. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to invest in a company and they said, we have 12 customers, you would first thing you'd say is, how many of them are paying? Let's define what the word customers means. Because a lot of times, Alan, people will say they have 12 customers. But a founder might think, opportunistically or they might be overly generous with that term. 12 people who are using the product for free are not customers, they're users. Users use a product, customers pay for a product. So step one is you wanna say to your founder, can you define customers? Who are they? How are they using the product? Are they paying for it? How much are they paying for it? When did they start paying for it? How much have they paid in total? Are they on a monthly contract? Do they pay for the year, et cetera? Mm -hmm. But the second thing I think you want to do is when they tell you the 12 customers, you may find out six of them are on free trials. And then of the other six, only two are actually using the product. So then what I would do is I'd stop and say, okay, who are the two? Tell me about the top two customers of the product and let's look at their metrics. Let's go ahead and pull up their accounts and let's look at how often they're using your product and how they're using your product. And you can do this without you know, disclosing who they are or you know, any of their personal information, but if you knew the number of times they logged in, let's say the product was a chat software like Slack or HipChat uh, for an enterprise or it was Superhuman or Gmail for mm -hmm. corporations for email. If you knew how many emails they sent or how many messages they replied to or sent in a Slack or a Yammer or a HipChat, you would have an idea of engagement. How engaged are they with the product? And then you could also look at churn. How many people stopped using the product? Brian, what are your ideas about verifying and doing your diligence, as Alan is asking, about a potential investment? So probably my three or four favorite, most entertaining sections of the book were the ones where you have this discussion virtually, right? You have this discussion with a, uh, a founder. Yeah. Like, hey, so tell me about these customers. And you just peel back the layers. And there are so many layers to it. Mm -hmm. It is never straightforward. It's not yeah. a little grid with like six customers paying this equals this. It's just never, or 60, whatever it yeah. is. There's always um, optimism baked into the numbers, yeah. right? There's always delusion. And you want delusion in a founder, but you don't want lying. And there's a very thin line between the two. Right. So... Uh, and you see people cross it all the time, and sometimes they know they're doing it. Sometimes they just don't know they're doing it. So it's it's very tricky. I think what you said is you you look for usage. I think that's a great way to do it. Forget how many people have registered, downloaded, whatever it is. How many people are friends versus not friends. If you have an ex boss who's using your product, that might be a negative signal, like oh that doesn't really count as a customer. But if they're addicted to it, 
Mm. I think you want to know, why are they addicted to it? They're actually using it. They actually made 18 videos or 20 sales, or they put in 90 of these things, or they opened it this many times, and they did these activities in it. That's fantastic. I want to know that. I also would want to know why people tried it and left, right? So maybe get, get the two ends of the spectrum and see, well, why wasn't it a fit for you? Well, if they changed these three, thing, these three things, I would be addicted to it. Or it just wasn't right for my industry. Mm. Oh, great. Well, what could they have done to make it right for your industry? And I think, again, the early stage investor needs to be able to fill in that picture for you. And I think if you talk to people who used it and failed and used it and loved it, that's great. If you can't find people who use it and loved it, though, probably should run. One thing uh, I like about your comments is, you know, if the source of the product where you got that customer was your friend or your cousin, well, that would seem like, oh, that's not a real customer. Unless you unpacked it and, yeah, your cousin got you into Goldman Sachs, but in Goldman, it's another department and they're loving the product and they're going to go to town with it and they're paying for it. So the source of how you acquired the customer is critical because you want to know how they're sourcing customers. Did they get it from a Facebook or a LinkedIn or a YouTube ad? Did they cold call the customer? And what you're looking for is a dialogue that feels honest, hardworking, logical. It's just the story makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of uncovering the truth by asking targeted questions, open-ended questions, and letting the founder talk. But one thing I would like to impress here is that you have to do some level of diligence. Right. And one of the best pieces of diligence is to say, can you give me three reference clients for me to talk to? The act of asking for references will almost certainly clear out people who are lying or delusional. Mm -hmm. And I literally had somebody I wanted to take to the incubator and they told me all about this great customer. And I said, great. And then I had my chief of staff. I said, ask them to talk to them. And they said, they won't let us talk to the customer. And I said, you know what? Why? And they said, oh, one of our advisors said you shouldn't do that. And I said to them, I said, well, founder X, if you call your customer first and say, would you mind speaking to a potential investor? If we land this investment, it would let us pour more resources into the product, which would make it better for you. Mm -hmm. If you can't talk to them, that's okay. Would you mind if they just emailed with you, if you can't talk to them on the phone, and if they asked you a couple questions over email? Now you've given two different ways for them to communicate, email or on the phone. If they still don't want to do it, okay, fine, but they have just flat out refused, which to me said that, well, they don't want investment. They're not hungry because they, they won't make this happen or they're lying and they don't really have this customer or this customer they don't trust to say good things. The customer might say, yeah, I don't know. I don't really use the product, right? So there was something fishy. Right. Something wasn't right and I didn't do the investment. It's, it's no different than if I'm applying for a job with you. And you ask me for three references, right? right. So, so maybe you're not used to the angel investing space. Maybe you're just starting out. But you've certainly applied for jobs or you've had people apply to work with you. Yep. So take it back to that. If I give you three references, I'm pretty sure I've warned them all. I've told them to play up my strengths. When they say, what's my weakness? Oh, his weakness is he just works too hard and cares too much and sells too much. Like, yeah. right? Like, those are my weaknesses. This okay, great. guy is a workaholic. Correct. So once you have those three references, awesome. Now go to my LinkedIn and find the place I was fired from. Yeah. Now go find a person who hates me. Right. Go talk to those people. Find the gap right? in my resume. You, I think you have to look at both ends. <laughs> Correct. Right. What, 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 with those 18 months, where do they go? Right? Yeah, exactly. There we go. Uh, okay, let's take another question. This one's from Sheila. When completing financial due diligence, what documents should I be asking for? What am I entitled to? Great question, Sheila. Uh, depending on the level of investment, if you're a venture capitalist, you can ask for an entire data dump because this is going to be millions of dollars, in which case you could say, give me every bank statement. Right. Give me every check. You could pull everything. You could talk to the accountants personally. You could go visit the accountant's office. You could do uh, a data dump. You could have a data room, as we call it in the business, which is a file folder on a G drive or a Dropbox where all the files are held, and you could just go through every file. So... You could have a data room, and that's fine. Uh, when you're an angel investor, you might just ask for banks. You might ask for a PNL, profit and loss statement. You might ask to drill down into specific areas. Okay, I see here salaries. I see eighty thousand a month in salaries. You told me you have four people. That seems like two hundred fifty thousand a year each. Can you explain to me exactly what everybody's salary is and how you hit eighty thousand? And it might be, yeah, I'm paying myself half a million dollars a year. Okay, let's have that discussion. Why is that? Oh, I'm personally in debt. I have four kids in private school. I've been divorced twice. I got alimony payments. I can't do this business unless I make five hundred thousand. Maybe there's a possibility that you'd still invest in the company if the person had that conditions. If they were a very successful entrepreneur, so you want to ask for some basic documents, maybe a data room. 
if you're a small angel investor, you probably have less access. If you're a major one, you have more. If you're a venture capital firm, you have all, if that makes sense. What are your thoughts, Brian? No, I completely agree. Uh, I think the less you're putting in, the less you can ask for, right? But I think at a minimum, when she says, what do I need to know? What do I need to look for? I think at the minimum, list all the things that if you found them out two years from now, you would have said no to this deal versus writing a check. Mm. Now go back and say, okay, all right, I just need to know, right? This, 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 right? I want any personal tax statements, maybe. maybe I, I, whatever the questions are, figure out what that is. And whatever you can live with, not knowing two years from now, you don't need. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question from Mark. How can I tell if the founder is a right fit for the company? How can I tell if there's founder company fit? I'll let you take that, Brian. Yeah. So in the book, this angelthebook.com book, you talk about investing in founders. Not, you know, there are no billion dollar companies or billion dollar ideas. There are billion dollar founders, right? So it's a funny question because it's like, how can I tell if the founder is the right fit for the company? Um, I think you'll be able to tell. Like, that's the only thing you need to figure out. Yeah. So it's not really, I mean, if you're in love with this company, but you're not in love with the founder, you're not in love with this investment. Right. That's it. You're only betting on the founder. At this stage, three years from now, there, there, there are a bunch of other investors who will make sure that the right founder is running this company. But I don't think it's an angel's job in the sort of, uh, you know, early conception of the company, week two to choose whether a founder is right or not. If the founder is not right, the company is not right. Correct. And if you look at companies that scale, like if you look at a Google, they had Eric Schmidt running the company. Mm -hmm. If you look at Uber now, they had Ryan was running the company, then Travis, and then they now have Dara. So a company with escape velocity, and you know, you had Larry and Sergey running the company, then you had Eric Schmidt, now mm -hmm. you have Larry as CEO. So you could have different people at different times. Right. Later in the game, when the company has got escape velocity and predictable revenue, of course. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. If you have a founder who is not truly passionate about the idea, sometimes you can tell that. If you ask them, why are you doing this idea? And they say, oh, well, I think I can make a lot of money. I can flip it. Right. I can flip it, or Microsoft will buy it, or mm -hmm. Facebook's not doing it, therefore they'll buy us. Like, if they're already thinking about the exit strategy, you can be like, hmm, I don't know if this person's actually going to stick with it. Right. And that's one of the things that you uh, have a real risk as, as an early stage investor, is that the founder will get bored and quit. Right. And if a founder gets bored and quits, wow, that's a real bummer, because you lose your entire investment, typically. Mm -hmm. So... If the founder can speak knowledge be about the product and you can read their passion, they don't have to be spastic in their passion. They don't have to be bouncing off the walls. But if they're really deeply into it and it's all they think about and they're not working on anything else in their life, wow, you have somebody who's obsessed with it. And you're really looking for somebody who's obsessed with it. And sometimes they've had a whole life before that. And this is a theme. So if you look at somebody like Evan Williams, right. I bring him up a lot because he's got three companies. All three companies were publishing-based companies. He's working on a theme. Actually, he had four companies because he had Odeo, which was podcast publishing, which he was too early for. Right. But he probably shouldn't have quit that one. He probably should have persisted. It would, probably would have been very big right now. But he personally was not really into podcasting at the time. Mm -hmm. So he was like, eh, I'm not really passionate about this. There's some opportunity here, but it's not for me. So passion about the vertical, the customers, the product, being obsessed with it is really critical. Okay. The next question is from David. And he says, what is the best way to evaluate a founder for persistence? It's a very interesting question. It is. You can ask people about things from their background, mm. but it's very hard to say, like, what's the worst day you ever lived through? Or what's right. a big traumatic experience or a family event or whatever it is? Um, it's a very hard thing to gauge, right? Um, until you've actually seen them go through something. So I think you ask people often about just their family background to see where right. they come from, which is a great question. It's kind of disarming. You may learn some things from people there, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to gauge if it's your first time ever meeting this person. Hmm. Because what are you going to do? Take their word for it? That I'm, I know, no, I'm really persistent. I'm really in. But like you said with Evan Williams, if I can look back and say this person has been focused on conquering this thing for a long time, they have deep insights into it. They are intrinsically invested in this thing, um, then you can tell. But it, it's, it's hard. I mean, even if they did live some, through something, it doesn't mean they're necessarily resilient or persistent. Here's one thing. It's a little bit of a hack. During the fundraising process, are they persistent? Ah. So I have on my email address, if you email jason at calacanis.com, there is a bounce that says this email gets 500 emails a day. Uh, I don't, you know, don't I don't well don't I can't get through all of them whatever it's simply not true I put that up there but I actually do read all of them or I cursely look at all of them 
sometimes I can't get to all of them on vacation or I'm traveling or I got a busy schedule, but I eventually try, get generally get through everything. And then it says if it's super important, email my chief of staff uh, or my uh, executive assistant. And I notice people sometimes do. We're like, I think Jason really needs to see this investment. Or they go find three people who know me. So sometimes I'll have a founder email me cold and then have three other founders, investors they know email me and say, you really should meet with Brian. You really should meet with Susan. This person's the real deal. So that shows a level of persistence. And then meeting with me and following up with me. So here's a great persistence tip. If you don't get an investor after one meeting, well, that's the default state. But what if you send them your monthly update? As we talk about in chapter 27 of the book, you got to have monthly updates. What if you consistently email a monthly update to the to the investors who you didn't close? Well, if the chart's up and to the right, they may by the fourth or fifth month ask for a meeting again. Right. Because you've so persistently and doggedly kept them informed of your company. So this is the ultimate hack, is giving monthly updates to investors who passed, but who showed some interest during the meeting. I think it's fascinating that you say that the... The dance and the uh, the time they spend trying to to pitch and land you as an angel investor is a great uh, precursor, proxy. at least proxy, right? It's a prediction for how they're going to be with customers. So if so, if somebody is persistent with me enough to wear me down to get the meeting, to wear me down to say like, yes, you're going to get the check, whatever that thing is, but they're not so aggressive that it's a turnoff and I hate them and I never want to see them again, then they're probably going to be great at selling customers. Hmm. Not too strong, not too soft. But right in between. So. Yeah, you want to be just right in that Goldilocks zone. I'll tell you what's not right. Uh, when I was in New York, I had a dinner, and I met a couple of founders, and one of the founders has been SMSing me. And it's like desperate 1 a.m. SMSs about running out of money and not being able to pay their rent. and It just seems like spastic and inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, I really care about all founders. I hope you succeed, but... If you cannot make your rent, and maybe you shouldn't be a founder right now, maybe you should be working yeah. for a startup or a big company, get some resources, have a year's worth of salary in the bank, be frugal, and then start your entrepreneurial career next year mm -hmm. when you have some dry powder to be able to take a year run at it, right? Right. So you don't want to be so aggressive that you show up at a fa somebody's office. That would be a turnoff. Sure. You don't oh, want to no, be, I had a Y Combinator founder back in the day hack my voicemail and change my voicemail outgoing message because Verizon had some like little hack that he was able to do. He got kicked out of Y Combinator for it. It was a really stupid thing to do. You can look it up. I think there was a TechCrunch story about it back in the day. So be careful. You don't want to be so aggressive that you come, it's a turnoff. Right. Persistent would be great talking with you, wanted to give you a quick update on the business and keeping it professional. Right. Keeping it based on the facts. Trying to talk somebody into something they don't like is not going to work, but Trying to be a good person who does great work in the world, that will be a natural attractor. Right. Progress is an attractor. If you're growing 30% month over month, that's an, a natural attractor. If you're adding great talented people or other investors, that's a natural attractor. Mm -hmm. So I think look at every investor as a journey. Right. Look at it as a journey. And the same thing with angel investors. Look at if you didn't get into this round with a founder, they're going to raise the money again, so maybe get into the next round. Okay. If I had, this is a question from Brian, not Brian Alvey, but another Brian. If, uh, if an idea sounds exciting, but I don't have any experience in the vertical, how do I intelligently evaluate the opportunity? So I'm an angel investor. I don't have experience in the vertical of transportation, but I'm considering an investment in Uber, or I don't have it in hospitality, but I'm considering an investment in Airbnb. What do I do? What do you think, Brian? So, so think about the, you have six unicorns and roughly 150 yeah. investments, right? Um, how many of those six unicorns could you have been the CEO of personally? Okay, so Uber, uh, no, because I would not have had the wherewithal to deal with the amount of uh, lawsuits with cities, and I would have found that just too... City by city battles. The city by city battles, I just don't think I would have had the... I, I mean, I have the fortitude, but I wouldn't have the motivation, if that makes okay. sense. Yep. I mean, I, I could plow through it, but I don't feel like I would have wanted to. Mm -hmm. Thumbtack, I don't have a passion for local services. So, like, I don't know if I would have kept iterating on that business the way Marco and his partner did. For data stacks, I'm not a back end database geek. I mm -hmm. wouldn't have done that one either. Uh, but I knew enough about all three of those businesses to know as a consumer, I love the first two. And then the third, that Oracle databases were wildly expensive right. and weren't, 
there was a new database paradigm coming that would be cheaper and better. And then looking at Wealthfront, I knew I loved the product, but again, I'm not passionate. I don't have founder product fit about financial services. And desktop metal, 3D printing, I know nothing about it, but I knew the founder was a killer. Um, and uh, Robin Hood? Robin Hood. Okay. I don't trade stocks actively, but I knew the founders were brilliant. Right. So, so in so all of those cases, I personally, I think, use the product in half of them. Mm-hmm. And the other three, I don't use the product. But, you, but besides not being able to personally invent that and run with it right. and make, take it to the promised land, yeah. you probably also didn't have spectacular vertical advice for them on what to do with Uber in Miami versus New York versus whatever. I did right. have good advice for Uber, Wealthfront, you, you, and Thumbtack as a app, consumer. Correct. Because my as a consumer, milieu, I think right. if I'm using the word correctly, my milieu is consumers. Mm-hmm. But in the other ones, there are verticals that are not consumer and I'm, you know, we're not as consumer and so. Right. So number one, if you don't think you could run this thing or take it to the promised land yourself or have great advice to them, it doesn't really mean don't invest in them. No. Because you would have missed out on your six biggest investments. Yeah. All right. So definitely stay in there. But I don't think you have to then, based on that as well, uh, worry about the fact that you're a perfect fit for this or that they're going to invite you to the meetings to tell their teams what to do yeah. or an app review or, you know, what city to conquer next, right? So yeah, this is I, a, I this is a, a bad th- – this question is not a bad question. Mm-hmm. It's – it's a false premise that you don't actually have to have the experience in a vertical to intelligently evaluate it. You can intelligently evaluate the team and the founder Absolutely. and the customers. Right. So have you can route them. around it by just talking to the customer and say, how much do you love it? Mm-hmm. And if a cancer patient tells you, I love going to this you know, chemotherapy uh, versus the other chemotherapy mm-hmm. I was doing because I'm less sick and I have better strength afterwards and... You know, some better, doctor better says, I love life, doing right? this because the patients who take this chemotherapy treatment do better because they're less nauseous, mm-hmm. which means they come back to it more often and they're, there's less, uh, there's more um, uh, compliance mm-hmm. with this drug sure. or whatever. That could be enough for you to make the investment. And if you see that the customers love it and there's passion from the founders, mm-hmm. what more do you need to know? Right. You know, like I'm never going to use Airbnb. Mm-hmm. I don't want to stay on a serial killer's couch and I, nor do I want a serial killer staying on my couch. I'm doing that tomorrow night i'm not willing to if i could make 500 dollars renting out my extra bedroom i know that's not the going rate but even if i could make 500 and you know triple what Mm -hmm. the going rate would be for my extra bedroom i still wouldn't do it i don't need to and i don't want the inconvenience of a person so does that make me not the market no if i was a younger person and i was 25 and i was having a struggle to get to make my rent i absolutely would have rented mine so at a different point in my life, I would have been the customer. So that's the other thing people have to remember is like, you may socioeconomically, geographically not be the customer of the product. That doesn't mean that there's not a huge base for customers. I don't do payday lending. Right. I don't need loans. I don't need to cash my check. But you know what? When I was 18 or 19, I right. didn't have a bank account. But you also weren't. And I would cash my checks. Then, you know? Yeah, but I would cash my checks at the ca- check cashing right. pace. And it only took me six months to realize that giving 5% of your check every week was stupid when mm-hmm. you could put it in a bank and for free get the money. Right. And that if I just was able to manage my money slightly better, I didn't need to take cash out the day I had my check. Mm-hmm. I could give them my check and wait 48 hours. Or I could take the time to fill out a direct deposit and get my money two days earlier from my boss than waiting for Friday for the print checks. Right. Remember in the 80s, people would wait yeah. for their print checks and then go to the bank mm-hmm. and get cash and then go to lunch? It was crazy. We lived hand to mouth in those days. Uh, okay, uh, great question. Thanks for asking. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll ask for more questions. Oh my God, I'm so happy. I get to read an advertisement for my favorite app on my phone. It's called Audible, and you know I love Audible. And I am reading Ready Player One. This is an amazing book. And guess what? This book about virtual reality and the near future, it is read by none other than Will Wheaton. Yes, the actor, voiceover actor. He reads the book, and it is amazing. You can access that book from anywhere on your iPhone, your iPad, Android, Windows. And there are so many great features now in Audible. If you haven't tried it in a couple of years, my God, are you in for a delightful surprise because they have beautiful channels with all kinds of free content and exclusives. You can send a book. So after I read a book, a lot of times I send it to my wife to read. You can share clips on your social media and you have easy chapter navigation. You remember when the old days you get an audio book, you didn't remember where you were, you lose your place. Now, 
when you're on your desktop or on your phone, it remembers the last place you were, and everything's now nice and easy in chapters. Sometimes I forget because I like to jump from book to book, and I find out I'm halfway through a chapter. You know what I do? I start it over. I get that delightful moment of starting it over. And you can control the speed. So you can go one speed, one and a half times, one and a quarter, two times. Sometimes you get a narrator who talks too slow, and you have to speed it up. Other times you get me narrating my book, Angel, and I'm too fast, so you can slow down. This is one of the great, great new features inside of Audible. Speed control is amazing. And you want to use it during your commute. Everybody's got that commute, almost everybody, unless you work from home. And it is an amazing way to get motivated for the day. On my way into work, I like to listen to an audiobook. On my way home, I like to listen to an audiobook. And sometimes I leave the office in the middle of the day, and guess what I do? I put in my AirPods. I get my steps in, I do two quick miles, and I spend 40 minutes listening to an Audible book. Get motivated, get smart, transform your commute with these amazing narrators who turn the mundane into the delightful. Get productive, and I have to say, my pick of the week, you're going to love it. Go to audible.com slash angelbook to get my book, audible.com slash angelbook. That's just for you, a 30-day free trial membership, and you can download my book of the week as well at audible.com slash angel book. Will Wheaton reading Ready Player One. It is filled with delightful anecdotes and references from your childhood, from the 80s and the 90s. It is a pop culture bonanza. They were talking about Blade Runner. They were talking about Atari 2600. They were talking about my entire childhood, even Joust and Centipede and Tempest, all these great video games I played when I was a kid. I loved Ready Player One. And it builds and it builds. So if you get through the first third and you think, hmm, it's a little bit slow, it picks up about halfway through. And Will Wheaton is an amazing narrator. I, you know, I want to click on Will Wheaton inside of the app and just look for other books he's read because he's an incredible narrator. Okay, audible.com slash angel book. Audible.com slash angel book to get your 30 day free trial membership. Okay, let's get back to this amazing podcast. Okay, we have a couple of questions here about syndicating your deal. Syndicates, just to give people a quick definition, uh, are something that you can do on Seedinvest, AngelList, or jasonsyndicate.com, where I run my own. It's when a group of angels will get together, one lead angel, the syndicate lead, and they will lead a group of angels to put, say, 5K on average each into a deal. 50 of them put $5,000 in each. You get $250,000 in your company. It's like getting a lead for your angel round. So let's talk about that. Uh, first question is from Kyle. When I invest via a syndicate, is my identity kept secret? Is my name on the cap table? So Kyle, no, your name is not on the cap table. Typically what's on the cap table is the name of the SPV, Special Purpose Vehicle, which is an LLC that might be called Jason Syndicate LLC. The founder then only needs to get one signature, my signature, the syndicate lead signature, and those syndicate members never have to expose their email or names to the founder, although they may want to, to get information like a monthly update. Mm -hmm. So depending on which platform you use, your name may or may not be exposed, but you do not and are not required to sign paperwork and have an ongoing liability in that way. So that's one of the nice things about doing angel investing through Jason Syndicate, Seed Invest, or AngelList. You give up that, indiv- you get access to deals you wouldn't have access to. You don't have to do the paperwork. You can write a smaller check. You can write a smaller check and you can pass on certain deals and you don't have to diligence them, although I suggest you do. But a lot of affluent people just choose to put 5K automatically into 20 deals a year to get 100K in exposure for five years and have 500K exposed, which might be 5% of their $10 million net worth. And they want to take a flyer here and see if they hit something big. Um, it's risky. But as I, uh, we describe in the book, angelthebook.com, you uh, can do this intelligently and make small bets and then learn. So, no, your name will not be exposed. Any thoughts on the syndicate uh, uh, process sure. there? Yeah. Having, I mean, I did an angel list syndicate with you yeah. two, almost three years ago. Yeah. And I can tell you as a founder, the only information that I get is an exportable spreadsheet, which gives the name and uh, amount. Mm-hmm. So whether it was 1K, 2K, 5K, 20K, whatever Not the email, is. not the phone number. Not the number. email. No, I can't even contact them. The only way to contact 
my syndicate investors from three years ago is through the AngelList software. Yep. I can send them all a message. I can send them individual ones or whatever. Over time, it's been three years, uh, most of them are LinkedIn friends with me. A Perfect. lot of them are on my, uh, we're on our beta mailing list while we were building our software. Yeah. So I have relationships with some of them, mm -hmm. uh, but not all of them. Yeah. So I don't know that you can remain anonymous in that platform, but you certainly can be really you hard could to actually, connect you with. You could create your own LLC, I think, yeah. or your own investment vehicle and right. invest through that name. I believe you could do that. Right. So I could have, you know, J Dog Investments right. and put them in there if you J really. J Club with five people. Right. What's that? J Club with five people and exactly. I don't even know who you are. Yeah. Right. So you, there is ways you could do it, but generally, um, I don't think you, the founders would want to have secret identities on there. And founders tend to be a little more open minded to syndicate, but there have been times I've had syndicate people say, you know, somebody who worked at Uber is right. in your syndicate, or right. somebody at Google, at Google developers in your syndicate, and they invested and now they're getting my monthly update. Right. Oh, I don't feel this feels like there might be some competitive intelligence some, some issues. People worry about a competitive investor yeah. who's in something else putting in a grand yeah. just to get in on what you're doing, or somebody who works at your biggest competitor. Uh, yeah, and I generally there, don't right? think you have to worry about that. Unless you still got their thousand dollars. <laughs> I don't think you. Yeah, exactly. And they're, they're they're still giving you money to help you grow. Mm -hmm. right. But I also think that most people don't have the time to go then do yeah. a plot that sinister. Right. Uh, and if the information you're sending is considered confidential, y you can choose how much you share. You don't have sure. to tell. You could tell them how you're doing, but you don't have to tell them these are our top ten clients. Right. Here's our pipeline. Of Here's our upcoming pipeline. Sales. Right. Here's our three greatest growth yeah. hacks. You don't have to tell if, if them. If an investor that. wants that information, they will get a meeting with you, and you will be giving that all to them anyway. Right. I've seen investors kind of make the rounds in an industry mm. to just drain the brains, get all the information, and then pick which one to put the money in. Yeah. And they've got super intelligence across the whole space. Right, so meeting with everybody in a vertical, I frequently will have a founder get upset and say, this person met with us and then invested in the company. I was like, that's because it was a better opportunity than right. you. You should look in the mirror and say, why? Was it your valuation? Was it your mm -hmm. terms? Was it you, the founder? Was it their traction? Was it their product was better? Mm -hmm. Did their customer references work out? You should expect that somebody meets with everybody and you shouldn't expect if that company then goes around and does something that you were gonna do, if we were all in the you know, on-demand food space, mm -hmm. and we decide, oh, we're going to put the food in the car. We're going to have a, in the back of the f car, we're going to have apple pies. And every time you order from whatever restaurant you order, we're going to upsell you on an apple pie for 10 bucks. And you had that same idea to put apple pies, which are not perishable in the back of every tr car, and upsell on it. That's, that's not a proprietary idea. Right. You shouldn't assume that it was stolen from a VC. VCs don't have the time, or angels, they don't have the right. time to steal ideas from one company and put them into the other. It very rarely happens. There have been edge cases, but it generally does not happen. Here's the next one. I have a great opportunity for your syndicate. What's the best way to discuss investment opportunities with you, Jason, Mariana? What do you think, Brian? What do you think I will answer here? Yeah, the best so, way to pitch me uh, to discuss an investment opportunity for the syndicate. So I will tell you uh, what I tell everybody who asks me ah. to forward something on to you. Great. Um, which is also a bit of a... A sham, which is, I say, uh, pretty much anything I send to Jason, he hates. He takes me, like like when you and I talked about which companies in the first um, uh, incubator class yeah. were going to be successful. I told you my favorite one. It's gone now. And you said, yeah, it's going to be the first one to fail. I think it was one of the first ones to fail. And that's why you'd be a bad angel investor. So I just, I take that story and I give that to people and I say, sorry, if I send him a company, he thinks like, I don't know what I'm doing. So it's a negative signal. <laughs> and so just, just don't send, just go direct to him. That's right? hilarious. So I just tell him, like, don't bug me because I'm going to use that for the three things I care about every year. Right. Not the three things I got emailed about this week. Right. I'll be emailing you every day. Like, right. Then you, you would just, you stop I have it. the same problem with right. Elon Musk and Travis, which is everybody wants sure. to name intro to right. them. And I'm like, they don't take it. I, I don't send intros to those people because right. they're busy. So we used to uh, have Mark Cuban's blog. We worked with him. Right. right? He was everybody our, wanted us to turn right. Mark Cuban. And so, um, so we came up, I came up with an answer then too, which is a variation on yours, which is, you know, um, Mark, I think, really sees it as like a sign of respect or of, of like a determination if you email him directly and go in cold. Yeah. If you come in with my help, it looks like maybe you're weak. Right. And so, yeah, I'm not going to help you. Anyway, so I, I don't so like to. Uh, the way I'm going to interpret this answer, Marianne, is I think a co I'm going to go through all the possibilities here. Number one, somebody I've invested in going to bat for you yeah. – is a great thing. So if I did invest in Brian or Travis and they say, this person's brilliant, I've known them for X number of years, fantastic. I will take that meeting. Almost by default, I'll just say, I'll reply, CC my assistant and just say, sure, let's have coffee. If it's from a very trusted source. So if Chamath or Ruloff or Bill Gurley asked me to meet with somebody in the seed stage, I automatically snap meet with them, boom. Mm -hmm. Now, 
um, for the syndicate in 2017 going into 2018, I will say there are some frameworks that work better. There is no way to tell which company will pass the market uh, completely with the syndicate. Typically, it's some combination of the product, the market, and the founder. Product, market, founder. If the product is super incredible and sexy, like Cafe X or Blockable, these are very attractive to people, uh, great. If the traction is really good, like Kush uh, just did their syndicate and they've got great traction as a cannabis marketplace, fantastic. The founders may not be known, but the traction is good. And it's an interest, interesting market. So you can have some combination of those three things. But what really sends a signal is when you have half your round closed and you're looking to finish the second half. Mm -hmm. Now you've reduced two things. One, you have social proof. The syndicate isn't the first investor. It's the last investor, or it's among the second half of investors. That means that we are not having, we have extra validation or social proof. Um, confirmation from other known investors that it's good. And the higher the caliber of that investor, the more likely it is to happen. Second, if we're the second tranche of money coming in, the last 50%, that means there's enough money there to last 18 months or right. 12 months. So I'm always looking for a minimum of 12 months because it de-risks it because it gives the founder time to figure it out. One thing that the syndicate is very fickle and doesn't like, and I think AngelList even has a rule about this, is they will not, they will make you put a warning on it if this is less than 12 months of runway. Huh. Um, and they don't want deals that are less than 12 months of runway, Period. And I feel the same way now. I don't like doing syndicates for less than 12 months runway because I think for new angel investors who are doing syndicates, they want to know that there is at least some amount of time that you have to figure this out. It doesn't feel good to catch a falling knife and to put half a million dollars into a company. They burn through it in five months, burning 100 a month, and they never figure it out. No, they're spending three months on product and going right back to raising money again. Exactly. I, I want people working on their company and the market and right. selling, Okay. Uh, raising. Here's another question from the syndicate, from angels who are involved. Craig says, what is the standard carry? What is the minimum investment? Fantastic. These are set by the syndicate lead. In my case, it's a uh, $1,000 minimum investment is what we tend to go for. We may change that on a deal-by-deal -deal basis. And it is a 20% carry. I've seen people have 30% carry on uh, AngelList. I've seen people have less, 15% carry, but 20 is the standard. That's what venture capital firms tend to get. So you have a 20% carry, and then you also have uh, a minimum that's typically $5,000 for most syndicates, and sometimes if we're trying to raise 500K or a million dollars, we may put a 5K minimum on the deal. Mm -hmm. Why? If we have 100, there's a 99 investor limit, so right. let's just say it's 100. 100 investors at 5,000 each is 500,000. So we'll put the minimum at close to what the average would be if we got 100 people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll get a whale in there who will put 25 or 50 in. Sometimes that gives us the ability to lower the minimum to 2,500 or 1,000. What I'm doing in the future is I'm going to let the people, this is my current plan, and it's a moving target. Our syndicate has gotten large, so I'm going to let the people who write the biggest checks go first. Give them maybe five days to make a decision. If they make a decision and they put in 25 or more, they go first, or 10K or more, let's say. So we give 40 slots, let's say, to the people who invest 10,000 or more. The last 60 slots, we then give first come, first serve for $1,000 or more. What that means is if the 40K go to people who will do 10K and above, if they do average 15, okay, now we're at you know, 400,000 or 500,000 from that first group. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry as much about hitting the targeted amount. But this is one of the dynamics of syndicates is it's unlike a venture firm every time out the investors can change the amount they invest or they can pass on a deal. So it's a lot more work for us to have a syndicate and to share this deal flow than it is to have an actual fund. When you have a fund, everybody gives you the money and then you invest in whatever you think is the best as the fund manager and you don't write a deal memo every time to get each person to invest. So syndicates, 20% carry, one to 5K minimum is what people typically charge. So Any questions there? In, in your syndicate, then, uh, versus the fund, uh, just so everybody's clear, you would just need the one yes to write a $500,000 check or a $250,000 check. Right. In the syndicate, which seems like it's, in some ways it's easier because you'll be, you'll be putting in less yourself, uh, you need that first yes, and you need another 99 or 96 yeses. Yeah, right? in my so, case. So it's a lot more work You have to sell each me. one. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people don't 
uh, they, they look at it like you just flip a switch mm-hmm. and it just starts pouring in. You actually flip a switch and now you're allowed to go email 1,200 people on your syndicate. Now 2,000 personally. Came out. There you go. 2,000 people to personally sell each one to fill those 99 seats. Yeah. And they have to make their own decisions. And sometimes it's fickle. Sometimes we overperform. Sometimes we underperform. Right. And there's no way to know. But what we're trying to do over time is set the founders up for success mm-hmm. and set the angel investors up for success. Just like I don't, an IPO. Just like an IPO, exactly. I don't want to, except there's no liquidity, but I don't want people to have to deal with companies that are pre-product market fit. I want to see them actually launch with product market fit or some level of traction. So a little bit of that Goldilocks zone we talk about. Do you only accept U.S.-based companies, Bill? The answer to this is yes. Right now, I only operate in the U.S. International companies, I like to move here. Mm -hmm. I will have companies that are here that move internationally. I had one company that moved to Quebec. So they're now technically international, or they're in the 52nd state, (laughs) Canada, and uh, 51st being Puerto Rico. So 53rd being Mexico. Like We have uh, all these other states here that are sort of adjacent to the United States. But generally... You want an investor who's in your country, generally speaking, because they understand the dynamics and the culture and the operating environment. Countries are very different. You don't want an American investor in a French company or a Chinese company, in my mind, unless the company's got escape velocity, and then you might raise money on a global basis. But these markets are so disparate. The world is getting flatter, but it's not flat yet. How you operate in China, how you operate in India, and how you operate in Europe versus South America versus America is tremendously different. Right. The rules of the road are different. So to be able to invest wisely with a great chance of return around the world, most people haven't figured it out. And even a mighty company, a mighty investor like Sequoia, they have an India team and they have a China team. There are teams there that are not the same partners from America who are figuring it out in China. And it's not that you're not a fan of global startup communities. No, like in I am. Sweden. Yeah. I mean, you, you see these things happen. You're a big fan. I go you to love Sweden them, every other year. But hang out with Tyler. You know, you don't know the local regulations. You don't know how to help a business there scale. Nope. I don't know how to help them hire. That being said, we're going to do launch festival in Sydney the next two years. Uh, and the so the fifty fourth state. The fifty fourth yeah. state, uh, which happens to be fourteen hours away from here. But we're going to now start. The reason we're doing that is we believe that the, one of the big opportunities, one of my theses is, or thesi? It's a plural of thesis. Thesauruses. I don't know. Thesauruses, right, right no, like no, you yeah. said. Yeah. So one of my dinosauruses is, is that uh, internationally, we might be able to find companies that would come here to America. Like we found Cafe X in Hong Kong, and now they're based here 10 blocks away from our office. Bay so, Area Incubator. So Bay Area Incubator. Launch Incubator yep. is about finding those companies internationally, bring them here. Okay. Pam asks, what opportunities are currently available for non-accredited investors? Fantastic question. Thank you for asking, Pam. Let's start with the definition. Accredited investors in the United States currently, I think, is $200,000 a year in salary for an individual and a million dollars in liquid net worth. That is not Uh, their homes. Correct. That changes. The SEC has been changing that. There are now deals on Seed Invest where a non-accredited investor can buy shares, and I think the minimums tend to be $500. So go to Seed Invest, look there first. I really like the team over there. They do a good job vetting, uh, but it's very new. It's only one year old right now, this non-accredited investing. So I say go very slow, do the minimums, and learn until you become accredited and you get access to another layer of deals. We're also going to be doing some accredited investor deals ourselves, I be- non-accredited investor deals ourselves. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping to do that in 2018. It's taking a little bit of time because it's something new. Uh, So there are two possibilities here for you. One is to participate only in non-accredited. The second is to become accredited. So get a job that makes $200,000 a year. Figure out how to have enough skill to make $200,000 a year. Most people could figure that out in this lifetime. There are possibilities to do that. So that's the other possibility. Uh, Getting a net worth of a million dollars is kind of hard. So I also think that the regulations will change here in the United States. I think we're going to get to the point where the accredited, non-accredited delineation might go away in America in in the next 10 years. And it should, in my mind, because we have sophisticated investors around the world. And if you were a professor of economics at NYU and you made $150,000 a year and you had a net worth of $500,000, 
as a professional, a professional money manager who made $150,000 a year and had $600,000 in net worth, liquid net worth, would you as a money manager or somebody who took a test and wrote all these books on it, if you wrote a book on how to invest, you still wouldn't be qualified? Maybe we should have a test. Hmm. That would, to me, make more money. If somebody wrote a test, here is how to not lose your money investing, diversification, you know, bet sizing, like investment size, you know, how to shape your bets, um, due diligence. If we had a test, well, that might actually be better than this false or less, I wouldn't say false, but less accurate. You're, you have money, therefore you're smarter about money because you could have inherited the money and be dumb. If I inherited a million dollars and no common sense. I've heard of this happening. It's happened many times. People inherit a million dollars and they're dumb. Now, it's pretty hard to get paid $200,000 and be dumb, but it does happen. There are musicians or athletes or, you know, uh, actors who are dumb who get paid a lot of money. And you see that all the time. Some dumb athlete or some dumb uh, celebrity, you know, musician, actor, model, decides they're going to be an investor and they give a half million dollars of their $3 million net worth to a to a you know, a restaurant or a movie or, or a app. sports drink or their friend's app and it, it never works out for them. So these people are have money and are stupid, you know, or naive or inexperienced, whatever the word is. Some of them are just straight up dumb. So let's have a test is my proposal. What are your thoughts? Uh, I think that I'm glad you Generally. answered, you gave that answer so I could think of uh, a good answer myself. So uh, when you were talking about the professor of economics, mm. uh, looking back at the question, what opportunities are currently available for non-accredited investors? If you are a professor of robotics, and you're struggling, you're making 75 grand at a college, um, be an advisor to robotic startups. Yeah, get 50 dips, get a point. Yeah, be an advisor. You can make a lot of money advising people with your specialty. If you sell something somewhere, you could be a sales advisor. Mm. So plenty of roles that aren't purely putting in cash. Okay, we're rounding third base and heading home. We got a final question here. It's a long one, so I'm going to take it nice and slow. I would love any advice on closing mechanics best practices. Should I expect or demand an escrow type closing where all the money of the round comes in at once? Is this reasonable for seed rounds? Did we make a critical mistake in not lining up other money going and going verbally by dollar sign, you know, $100,000 was committed instead. So here's a situation that I've seen happen. Person's going to raise $500,000. That get, they're going to burn 40k a month. That gives them 12 months of runway. They raise 200k from two investors, 100k each. The 300k anchor backs out. Now they've raised 200. They put it in the bank and they start spending it. They're in month three of spending it. They've burned 120. They have two months of runway left. They lose the lead for 300. Now the people who put the 200K in, the 200K investors feel stupid. So can this be avoided? Yes. You can demand and you can put this into paperwork that the money will be collected when they hit 500K in signatures. You can actually put that into paper. The money wouldn't actually be held in escrow. Everybody would just sign and they'd say, we'll collect the money if we pass this threshold that can be put into a convertible note document. So yes, it can be done. Mm -hmm. Now, you want to have a candid conversation with founders. Again, back to that candid conversation with founders. Just like they might, as we talked about in diligence, be optimistic in how they define customers, they might be optimistic in how they define commitments from investors. So what I say to people now as an experienced investor is, who do you have lined up for this round of financing? And are they signed? Are they a verbal commitment? Are they a signed commitment? Or is the, are they signed and the money's in the bank? Which of those three states? And you'll be amazed. If they say they've got 400K committed of a million, they might actually have zero committed. They might have a 400K verbal commitment. I've had people say, we have 500K committed. I say, great. So I'll put in 250 and we'll be at 750. They're like, no, we're counting you in that 500. And I say, but I didn't commit yet. <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah, well, we assume you're committed. But, you know, so you get that idea. I'll, I'll give you a fourth state to look yeah. out for, which is um, they signed, they committed, they sent me the money. Uh, is, it, is it still in the bank or has it already been spent? Because sure. you can, I, I had a round for a while where it's like I raised half a million dollars. I just need to close the rest, right? Yeah. Uh, where is it? Oh, we spent it. And, uh, you know, now i got to yeah. close the rest, right? So, so you're closing the final 200 of the million. Right. 
But the people but you, are expecting and you're, burning you're, you're 50 sitting on top month. of a million dollars. Yeah. But you're not. And I had this happen too as well where I said to the person, you know, you can't say this person's in the round if they invested last year or six months ago. So uh. I told somebody, who's investing in this round and their money's not in the bank yet, they've signed, and they're investing in the last three months? Because somebody was like, well, I want to include this really big name person from last year because they're doing it on the same terms. I'm like, that's not – it might intellectually be correct or technically be correct that this is the same round of funding, but it's not ethically or morally correct. Or it's not the most correct answer, right? The, the, the new investor expects they're putting their money in next to a whole bunch of other people's money, right? not an empty account that was spent out of a long time ago. And this is where – not, not right. A big lesson for founders – Always err on the side of being transparent mm -hmm. and intellectually honest. Mm -hmm. Don't ever put yourself in a situation where when you explain the truth to somebody, they feel that you should have explained that truth earlier. Very simple. Mm -hmm. I could use a lot of metaphors here, but if I ask you, you know, have you ever committed a crime... And, you know, or if you, do you have a felony and you're like, no, I don't have a felony. And it's, you had a felony, but it was. What's bigger than a felony? I had, I had one of those. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, like some people, sometimes people have a felony that is, there's a term for it when it's washed away, when it's. Yeah, expunged. Like, expunged like from, from your record. record. Right. It was, you know, right. You know, if it was expunged and you said you'd never been arrested for a felony, you technically have been arrested for a felony. It's been expunged, so I can't find it. That doesn't mean it didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It does go back to that. Two years from now, when they look back and know the truth truth, would they have still put the money in? Yeah. And I really think there's... One of the things you're doing when you're talking to investors is you're building credibility with them. And you don't want to have any credibility busters. And I think being honest and candid about the state of affairs builds so much credibility for, an, for you that there's... It's actually an opportunity to point out when things are not perfect. So if you say to somebody, listen, I, uh, we're raising a million dollars. We've raised 700 of it. We've spent 500 of it. We have 200 left. We're raising another 300. We're burning 50 a month. It's going to be 10 months. If we get to month six, I may cut two people and outsource their positions, and I may take a pay cut myself to get us to 12 months. So I, I think this will be 12 months if we hit that, uh, and I'm committed to making it 12 months. That sounds a lot better, too. We're raising a million. We'll definitely have 12 months. Right. You know, and then they find out, oh, well, you also had this lawsuit that you didn't disclose that hasn't been settled, and, oh, it's not a lawsuit because they didn't file. They just wrote a nasty letter. Oh. You're, you're, you're foreshadowing that when something goes crazy six months or a year from now, I'm going to be honest with my investors mm -hmm. and ha ask them to help me work through it, not hide from the problem, Yeah. not fail to tell them about it. And one thing I'd like to point out here is you're starting out as an angel investor, and in the book we talk about this over and over again. I want you to start with small bets while you learn. Very small bets. The smallest bets you can make. Bet $1,000 on 20, company, 20 companies. It, that's a better idea than putting 20000 into one. Because if you're in this for the long term, why not, if you had a net worth of... I don't know, $3 million, and you wanted to put 200000 of it, like less than 10% into angel investing, do twenty k, $1,000 each into 20 syndicates, uh, and then whichever, one, whichever three turn out to be great, put twenty k into each of those. Because now you've learned over time, out of those 20, these 15 were dogs. Why did, they, why did you bet on dogs? Oh, you were betting pre-product market fit or you were betting on founders that you sourced from this incubator, which is terrible, or you sourced from this uh, you know, school that doesn't have great entrepreneurs. But these three came from people who previously had success in the last company, or the three of them were engineers, or the three of them came out of sales. Okay, now you've got some level of signaling for yourself, a thesis that you can lean into and then refine over time. But if you just plow it all into the first company you meet, that's your cousin's friend who you think is amazing, well, you're probably going to lose it. And then when you do lose it, you're going to have no more dry powder to go 3x on the winners or 10x on the winners. 
and that's where real money is made. So I want you to be very careful. I want you to go slow. I want you to learn the trade, learn the craft, and read the book, and then read the book again. I really think you got to read the book at least twice, if not three times. If you're going to go into angel investing, the books, you could read the book. You can listen to the book in two days. You can read the book in two days. So why not every year, at the start of the year, you read the book with fresh eyes? Literally, that's what I want you to do. Over the Christmas break, the holiday break, we're bringing back Christmas. We're going to say Merry Christmas again. This is my Trump impersonation. Um, oh, thanks. Go ahead. Just to let you know, nobody wants to say Merry Christmas anymore. We're bringing it back. No, over the holiday break. Or maybe you're July 4th. You're a patriot. Just read the book once a year on your birthday. Give yourself that reward. Give yourself that joy, Brian. Can you review it and give it stars every time you read it? Absolutely. Just just, just once. I don't know if you can give it six stars, but you could that could be the first line of your review. Love it. I gave this I, I gave this book five stars only because it doesn't allow me to give it six. Right. That would me if I read that review, I would warm my heart. I want you to read the book every year. You know why? Because you're going to forget stuff and then other stuff will resonate with you as you get burned. I know this because there are poker books that I've now listened to a second and third time. And uh, there's money at stake here. So why not get better? Why not read? I've read Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, four times so far. Just like you see a great movie, Gladiator, I've seen 10 times. I've seen Blade Runner 50 times or 100 times. If it's a great movie, it's a great book, read it over and over again. This book has money at stake. So if it's techniques on how to make money and how to build you know, a vast fortune, potentially, like you should read it more than once. It's a playbook. Read it more than once. Once a year is my prescription. Or any closing thoughts around angel investing, things that since the book came out, you said, hey, we got to include that in the follow-up. Anything that you've thought of, Brian, they said, you know, this would be something, because I have one thing, but I want to hear yours as well. Um, And if you don't have it, I'll go to mine. But what have you thought about since we wrote the book, so you say, you know what, in the next book, when we're doing those Friday or Sunday sessions, we write the next book, what should we include? Wow. So I have read the book many times. Yes. Um, <laughs> you edited but, the book. But not since it came out. Ah. You know what I mean? Like oh, I've read good. it so many times leading up to it. Yeah. And I haven't read listen it since. Listen to the audio. It's kind of fun. Um, I, 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 I listen to podcasts you're on, and it's just like, I know, I know this guy. I can't. <laughs> I can't. So as much as I love you. Uh, and But, you know, so um, no, I don't have any, like, I, I like the feedback people have given. Mm. You know, you got this math wrong or is a thing you should change or or even these questions, this whole thing today yeah. of of things, you know, because you never know when you say, like, here are the 30 things you should know and people still have 10 questions. You're like, oh, yeah. maybe we should have said 40 things, right? Yeah. So I, I like that people are engaged with it. The dialogue. I like that they are taking it and doing something with it. They're right. not just downloading it and saying thanks or whatever for making a great show, right? So I bought your book. They're reading it and they're kind of living it. Yeah. Uh, and then they're telling you things about it, which parts they like the best. So mm. um, I don't know. I think that's been very gratifying that going into it and knowing you and knowing you write well, I thought, ah, you can, uh, he's going to make a good book. Mm. But you made a really good book. You well, know? I couldn't have done it without you, pal. It's good. Here's the one that I would include if we could write it again, which is if you don't have money, picking the co- – this is what I would do for college kids. Meet with companies as an employee or job or just read about them on AngelList, wherever, and then put in a spreadsheet – that you're investing, and do the fantasy sports version of investing, which, by the way, a lot of colleges do this, where they give people funny money to invest, and then they, in stocks, and then they do the stock picking challenge, and you see who, the Hollywood stock exchange, you just do a virtual portfolio. Mm -hmm. I think you could do a virtual portfolio for startups where you say, I write a deal memo for 10 startups that I read about you know, when I watched This Week in Startups or I read about them on Product Hunt and I just checked right. in to see if that company ever raised money again. And if the company raises a Series A, raises a Series B, raises a Series C, you give yourself a certain number of points. Huh. Or watch the 200 things that came out of a demo day or the 20 things that came Perfect. out of a demo day. Yeah. Pick that, that cohort. And, and just see how, how many of them die. Yeah. Go to a demo day for 50 companies and then write down which one you think will survive mm-hmm. to Series A Series B, Series C, and which ones you think will not make it after a year? Which ones do you think will die? And see how your signaling is. Right. This is a great technique it's to get in the game. All right. This has been a great episode. Uh, if you have more questions, 
You can email jason at calacanis.com. You'll get that autoresponder that says, I don't read the emails, and it's a lie. I do. I stopped emailing you. You stopped emailing me, Brian? Now no. you just text me? No. So uh, email me anytime, jason at calacanis.com, my last name. The podcast is angelpodcast.com. And you can find it on YouTube, SoundCloud, and in iTunes and wherever. I don't think we're on Spotify yet. i got to talk to Emmy Award-winning producer Jackie about getting Angel onto uh, Spotify. Let's give them a quick email. Great. They do a great job on podcasting. Mm -hmm. And Spotify is an amazing product, world-class, tremendous, huge. Um, And if you really like the Angel podcast, please go ahead and write a review on iTunes. I'll pander for a review. Uh, I do read all those reviews, and I I really like them. Okay, thank you again to our partners for supporting independent media like Angel, uh, the podcast, and we'll see you all next time on Angel. Bye-bye.